Hey all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Andrew Rowe and I'm currently a cloud security engineer working and living in Boulder, Colorado. Now serverless is a big buzzword that we all hear nowadays in the tech sector as well as just casual technologists in general. And really what a lot of people don't understand is what serverless actually is and how you implement a serverless function or a serverless application. So without further ado, today in this video I'm gonna show you how to implement your first serverless API using AWS CDK, the cloud infrastructure tool that we were using in the previous videos, AWS Lambda, and AWS Gateways. This will be a three-part series. Today will be the first part, and we'll be provisioning the infrastructure for the Lambda itself. Let's get started. So as you guys know from my previous videos, I'm a huge fan of infrastructure as code, and in particular, the cloud AWS native tool, the CDK. If you haven't watched those videos to brush up on your CDK skills, I'll leave a link in the description below where I show you how to set up the tool and you know kind of basic functionality. But what is serverless? It's essentially an execution model where the cloud provider, in this case, AWS, is responsible for executing a piece of code by dynamically allocating the resources and only charging for the amount of resources used to run the code. Now, all this means is that you write some code in a serverless application or like essentially a serverless IDE and the cloud provider you're using takes care of the resources needed to scale or descale that function. But however, there is, there is a tiny bit of infrastructure creation you need to do when using serverless. And that's really what we're gonna be focusing on today, specifically with AWS Lambda. Now, Lambda from AWS is a compute service that lets you run code without provisioning or managing your servers. So the next time you hear someone say serverless or ask, or someone asks you, you know, during an interview question, what is serverless? Refer back to this video and say, oh, like AWS Lambda. And there you go. I just got you your first job, maybe. I have no idea. Good luck. So if we look in the actual AWS console, add Lambda and go to create a function, we see that there are only four steps to actually creating a function. So we'll come in here, we'll create a function. And all we have is function name, runtime, permissions, and we have to add a role. Now that might look really, really simple when you're doing it in terms of, you know, once, but it's, it's not gonna be that simple when you're actually trying to solve issues. And when you're actually trying to scale your code base as a DevOps engineer, as a cloud engineer, as a cloud security engineer, any of these things that have to use automation across multiple AWS accounts at once. Now again, in this video, I'm gonna be using TypeScript like I have in my past ones. It's just because it was the first language that the CDK actually uh, used to you know, query its tooling. It's, it's the first language that was supported by the CDK. But again, use whatever language you want. Use Python, use Golang, use whatever the CDK supports and whatever you wanna do. So if we were to actually break this down into smaller chunks, what we're going to be doing is we're gonna be needing to provision a role to give to the Lambda we're going to need to instantiate a variable that holds all of the, not only code the Lambda has, but the actual, you know, um, the actual infrastructure itself to create the Lambda. And when I say infrastructure, all I really mean is this right here. It's going to give it a runtime, which is the programming language that you're going to be writing the code in. Permissions, which is very, very big in AWS because everything is so, so parsed that it, you really need to specify your permissions really well the name, um, and a few other things that, you know, come along on the side when you're actually creating a Lambda itself. So if we were to do this here, the first thing that we would actually do is we would create the role to, you know, give this Lambda permissions to talk to different things. So the way I do that is I would add the IM users uh, library here. And I'm just going to add a couple and then I'll, I'll kind of tell you what they do, um, you know, as I do it. Get path. We need lambda, of course. Oh, that's an ampersand. I don't need that. I'm old. Give me a break, guys. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is we want to create the actual IM role, and all of these libraries are, you know, classified by what service in the actual console that actually creates. So for this, I am is usually, you know, correlated with I am users, but it's also correlated with I am roles. And a role is something that a service or a user can assume to actually, you know, have permissions to certain infrastructure 
in the environment. And it's a really, really secure way to do your infrastructure provisioning because you're not giving users a bunch of access to things, you're giving roles. And those are a lot easier to you know, bottleneck with specific permissions and, and security testing. So if we wanna create the actual role itself, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set a variable to uh, new Lambda role. And again, you can call that anything you want. That's just what I'm calling it. And I like the camel case. So I'm gonna set it to new I am role. I'm gonna pass it this, and then I'm gonna say test Lambda role. Now here I'm gonna pass some props. Uh, the, the roles in IM don't really have many props, but as you see, when we get to, you know, more of the Lambda stuff, they're going to have a good amount of props that you're going to have to know. And all of this is really in the documentation for, um, it, it's really in the documentation for the CDK docs, and you'll see one here, right? We'll get back to that, back to that in a second. But the props that we want to pass the IM role is we want to give Lambda permission to assume this role. Now the way we're going to do that is we're going to pass it a prop called assumed by and we're going to say new im dot service principal and again this is really just giving a service not a user access to a role so if we do amazon aws.com perfect now what we're going to have to do after that is we're going to have to take that role that we just created and add a managed policy to that role now that is going to give the role that Lambda is assuming actual permissions. So first we created the role that's being able to be assumed by Lambda. Now we're giving that role that we just created permissions that Lambda can use. So I'm gonna do test Lambda role, add manage policy, create a little tuple here, I am dot manage policy. And we're gonna say, you know, from AWS manage policy. And I'm just doing this to make it easier. I'm gonna give it admin privileges. And I know you guys are freaking out right now. Like how could you give it admin privileges? Trust me, it's not that big of a deal. You'll see why as we go along. This isn't giving it administrator privileges to the entire infrastructure. This is giving it admin privileges to that specific Lambda in that specific role. And that'll make a lot more sense as we go on here. But what's really cool about this is you can not only add a managed policy, which would be admin access, you can create your own policies. And if that's really something you guys wanna see, I'd be happy to make a video on that. Just let me know in the comments below. So we actually created a role, that's all done. Lambda's going to assume that role, but now what we have to do is actually create the infrastructure and the Lambda code. So let's do that right here. So if I do another variable here, let's do you know test Lambda server equals new Lambda dot function. Oop pass it this, we'll pass it test the Lambda server. And we need to pass it a couple different props, right? So like we saw in the actual console itself, and I'll refer, I'll refer back to it. Um, what we need to pass it is a function name, runtime, execution role, and you know, one other thing that it's not showing here, but I'll, it'll make more sense when I actually do it. So if we do that, what we're going to pass it is we are going to give it first the runtime, right? So we have to let it know what programming language is going to be used when we actually write this function and, you know, use this function. So I usually like Python 3.6 has a lot of functionality, has a lot of support, especially in Lambda with certain request libraries. So I definitely would recommend Python 3.6, but feel free to use 3.7 or 3.8. I do not recommend you use 2.7 or anything below three here, but do as you please. So we'll pass it that, we'll pass it the actual role that we just created. So it's gonna be test Lambda role. Then we'll pass it the handler. Now what this is, is this is going to be the handler at the top of the actual Lambda. So think of this like a main function. All of your code is going to be called in this handler, which the Lambda service kind of puts out there for other services to pick up or pass data to. And it needs to be, you know, called something very specific for Lambda to pick it up. So here you can see I have test Lambda code here. I just call mine handler and it takes an event and context. This is essentially an event coming in from another service and the context of that service. So think of this just like JSON data, but that's you know kind of getting ahead of ourselves. So when I pass the Lambda handler, usually what I do is I do test Lambda server because that's the name of the actual variable. And that's gonna be the name of the actual Lambda file when I show you guys that too. And then we're gonna just do a dot handler here. Oh, if I could spell. And Lambda should be perfectly okay with that. Essentially what it's going to look for is a file with the name test Lambda server. 
and then it's going to look for a handler function in that file and we have both of those right here so if we pass it the third prop now this is going to be where lambda actually picks up where the code that's going to be deployed is see as you see here and let me you know kind of shrink these directories down to make it easier i created a file called lambda here and now this lambda sorry a folder called lambda now this lambda folder is at the root directory of my entire project so when i pass it through the asset code that I'm gonna to have to give it, I'm gonna to have to give it the absolute path to that code so Lambda and the CDK know, hey, this is the infrastructure for the Lambda and here's the actual code we want deployed with that Lambda. So let's do that right now. So I do Lambda.code and then I say from asset. And again, this is all in the documentation. I'll definitely leave a giant documentation link in the description below so you guys can look through this and get started. Um, but I'm not just making a lot of this up. This is all syntax from the documentation. So I say dot join, and then I say directory name. And then here's where I actually pass it the directory. So I go into the Lambda folder, I go into the test Lambda server, and I just leave it there, right? And if you guys give me one second, I can explain that a little better. I'm having a little, there we go, okay. Let's just hit the home button here. Sorry, I'm having some, okay. So what this means, right? is if you look in the root directory, now mind you, the file that we're in right now is in the lib folder. It's a, it's a stack if you've watched my previous videos. So what I did is in the same folder that the lib folder in, in the root directory, I created a folder called Lambda. Now if I CD into Lambda, I created another folder called test Lambda server. Now if we CD into that, that's where you see the actual code is living. Now let me clear that and do an LS. <coughs> Excuse me. So the code is actually living here. Now, what I like to do in terms of syntax of, of folders and keeping everything clean is I like to make a folder for every single Lambda. So you'll see that the Lambda folder is called test Lambda server, but then the actual file for the Lambda is test Lambda server.py. That's just something I like to do. And here's why, because when I give the path to the folder, there could be multiple files in there and they could all have to do with the API server. So instead of actually, you know, passing it test lambda server.py, I just pass it the folder and it picks up all the functions or all the files in there and it just uploads them to the lambda service all in a, you know, kind of a batch process. And after we deploy, I'll kind of show you what that means. But the last thing we actually have to pass to our lambda is a timeout prop. Now this timeout prop is going to end the lambda because it's going to end the lambda in a certain time frame. And this is really useful because lambda charges per second that you are running your function for. So if you create a large function that has a lot of data to process, you're gonna be charged more money, it's that simple. So what I like to do as more of a fail safe so I don't have endless running functions if I screw something up in my code, I just pass it a duration, uh, a timeout duration of 300 seconds and you can make it as big or as small as you want, but 300 is something that I found works for me. Now, we created all this code. We created a role, we created a managed policy to be assumed by that role, we created a Lambda server, now we actually have to create the Lambda code itself in that Lambda server, in that test Lambda server uh, directory. So if you come in here, I already created the code. All this is gonna do is I specify, you know, the main um, handler and the main function. And then I created a test function that just says hello from Lambda, right? So that's it. All we have to do now is go back to the root directory of our actual project here, the serverless API. We run, let me clear this first so it's easier. We run a CDK list. And again, if you haven't watched my other videos, this is going to list all the stacks or all the specific files in the lib folder here. And these are called stacks, right? So if I want to deploy this stack, I copy, I paste, and I do a CDK deploy. Now, before I deploy this stack, I just want to remind you guys that the reason this CDK knows what file or what account to deploy to is based on the AWS CLI and, and my access keys in there. So again, if you have not watched my previous videos, this is gonna seem kind of weird to you. The CLI is essentially something that uses uh, access keys and secret access keys to authenticate to a specific region as well as an account. So if you haven't watched my previous videos, definitely go watch those and definitely check up on the CLI because this won't make a lot of sense in terms of deployment if you don't know what that is. So let's clear that so you guys don't see my keys. Now, if we want to uh, deploy this, we do a CDK deploy and we paste the actual stack name in and we should be able to deploy. Now this usually takes, you know, depending on the file, it could take a long time, but 
being as I've deployed this previously, this should do it pretty quickly. But one thing that's really cool about the CDK, and you're gonna see it below here, um, hopefully, is that it gives you the diff of the file that's already created or the stack that's already created because it has in stack memory of the code that's already in your CloudFormation stacks in that account. So if you are still in the same stack, in the same file, and all you do is change a little bit of code, it's going to not overwrite the code that's already deployed. All right, so sorry about that. Actually what had happened was I had a function previously that was named test Lambda API server, and it was of the same stack, and I was trying to redeploy it because I've done this before obviously, and it just aired out. So what I did was I renamed this, uh, the Lambda test Lambda API server, and then it redeployed and it worked perfectly fine. So if we actually go to the console, since it's deployed correctly, we should be able to refresh. And now we have a test Lambda API server um, file from the Lambda API stack living right here. So if we go in, we should be able to see the code itself. We do, it's the same code we have before. Now, if we wanna set up a test deployment or a test, you know, we wanna test the function, we can do so by configuring just a basic test event and all this simulates is data coming in from AWS and triggering the function. So I just created some test code and I click test. And as we see here, hello from Lambda. Now that's just the beginning. You know, that's just the outline of creating Lambdas with the CDK. All we did there was we created the infrastructure. If we go back to the actual Lambda function itself, we should be able to, you know, see that infrastructure, but all we did was create the infrastructure. We created the runtime here. We created the handler here. We created, um, you know, different keys that we have here. All we did was create the infrastructure for the actual Lambda. We gave it permissions that it needed, but we did all that in a very scalable and reproducible way by using the CDK, right? So in the next video, I really want to show you guys, you know, how to create not only the infrastructure like we did, but I wanna show you guys how to actually create the lambdas themselves so you can understand and you can create your own serverless lambda function or your own serverless application using totally just lambda, right? Obviously, we're gonna need a couple different resources to do that. In the next video, I'll show you guys the meat of the actual application using serverless APIs in lambda, but you're also gonna need you know, an AWS gateway, which is essentially just a gateway to the internet that's going to help you take in data for your API. But I really hope you guys learned a lot from this short little tutorial, you know, on outlining serverless and, and how to deploy the scaffolding for this serverless application in the cloud. And, you know, next video, I'll really show you guys how to create that API. And I really can't wait. It's going to be really, really fun. And I really think it's going to add a lot of, it's going to close a lot of gaps for you guys in your knowledge on actually what is serverless. As always, you know, remember to like the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and leave a comment if you have any questions. I really appreciate you guys all watching. I really, really hope you guys learned something from this video, and I can't wait to build on it in the next one next week. I will see you guys in that video. Take care.